CA, yeah, for you, you personally, Pat, what does it mean to be an entrepreneur? You know, to me, uh, entrepreneur is, um, I, I think it's different for a lot of people on how you view everything. When I think about the word, uh, um, you know, greatest basketball player of all time, I think about Michael Jordan. When I think about, you know, hockey, I think Gretzky. When I think about real estate, I think about Trump. When I think about certain things, a certain name comes up. When I think about entrepreneur, I think about math, uh, is what I think about. Because I think entrepreneurship is purely a mathematical formula. And for some, they get the solve for X sooner than others, but anybody that sticks to a formula for a while, they're eventually gonna figure it out. And uh, that's really what entrepreneurship to me is. If you can figure out a way to solve for X, whatever X could be, how can I help chefs who got out of school and they got a degree and all they do is make recipes, how can I help this guy go to the next level and build a brand and create a restaurant? Well, let's solve for X. I can help him how to do these 17 things right, and under the 17 things, I can add four points a piece, and I can introduce them to these five contacts, and these are the three things that they can do for their brand on social media. Solvent for X is how I view entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. that's, that's outstanding, and uh, a lot of people don't understand how to solve that problem, and the problem-solving skills that individuals have as they're coming out of education these days, I think are very much lacking. Problem solving and creativity. Now, is there a higher purpose that you're working toward? You know, you, you, you had your, you have PHP agency, you have value attainment. Is there, is there a goal that you have in mind? You're asking me? Yes. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Look, I mean, you know, I, <clears throat> I, uh, um, I was born uh, in a very interesting family. My mother's side, they were all communists. Uh, their Bible was the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, which I'm sure if you went to school, somebody recommended it to you. Uh, my father's side, they believed in imperialism because I was born and raised in Iran, so Reza Shah Pahlavi was an imperialist and he really changed a lot of things around in Iran, so my dad believed in imperialism. And I was purely confused. I was an atheist for 25 years of my life. Uh, I didn't care to talk about politics or, you know, faith or anything like that. And then. On one end, I heard somebody keep talking about how rich people are bad people. Literally, for the first 23, 24 years of my life, I hated rich people. I thought rich people were scumbags. They were greedy. They were, you know, they abused everybody. They used people. They were terrible people. They were, you know, self-centered. All they cared about was themselves because this is what was fed in my mind. And so eventually what happened for me is when I left Iran, we escaped six weeks after Khomeini died. We went to Germany, lived in Germany for two years and then uh, moved to Glendale, California in uh, 1990, November 28. I went to school, didn't do too well in school. I joined the army, I was in the army for a few years. And then when I got out of the army, I wanted to be the next Mr. Olympia. I was gonna be the next Middle Eastern Arnold Schwarzenegger is what I was gonna be. I was gonna win eight Mr. Olympias, I was gonna marry a Kennedy, I was gonna go into Hollywood, and I was gonna be a governor one day. That's, that's the dream, the vision of what PBD was gonna do. And then I somehow, someway got into sales, and through that I was introduced to a girl named Jean Vier who was working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter who told me I should get into financial services. I don't have a four-year degree, and Morgan only hires somebody with a four-year or an eight-year degree. And so I applied, I got started, and then next thing you know, um, I left. I started my own firm in October of 2009 after leaving Transamerica. And then once uh, uh, in 08, a, a strange thing happened to me. In 08, I had already made a lot of money. I had money in savings. I had spoken in front of hundreds of thousands of people. I had gained uh, the cool guy on campus. Everywhere you go locally, everyone knows you. You know, you're, you, you uh, are respected amongst your peers, your relatives. They look at you with all this pride. But some was missing. And in 08, my temper was extremely horrible. I was very short fuse in 08. Um, simply because I wanted to know what the hell am I doing with my life. This thing goes like this. One of my favorite places to visit is the cemetery because it's where we all end up. It just kind of reminds me. That's eventually where my home's gonna be and your home's gonna be. So what is PBD gonna be doing during this period to make an impact? And I got obsessed with studying different economical systems. I studied communism, socialism, capitalism, and I realized capitalism gave birth to a guy like me who's a simple guy, not the smartest guy in the world, uh, who went from uh, a 1.8 GPA in high school with an 800 on his SATs to now running a good sized company just because I chose to pick up 1300 business books and read them. And anybody can do that. Anybody that tells you no, you cannot. Anybody can pick up books and read it 
And so a guy asked me this morning, I posted something about capitalism, when I said in 2006, the following businesses weren't around. I went to Uber, iPhone, all these other things that still weren't around. And one of the guys said, in the next 10 years, do you think innovation is gonna be more or is it gonna be less? My answer was very simple. I said, as long as capitalism is a leading economical system, innovation will not slow down. The moment we get away from capitalism, innovation will slow down because the incentive to want to create isn't there too. So, so to fast forward into the question you asked, Valuetainment has a deeper goal on what it wants to do. Uh, our goal is to make sure every single soul in the planet knows about the benefits of capitalism and they'll have one of two choices. Either one, you are going to leave and go to a country that offers the economical system of capitalism. You're going to fill out your green card to be accepted to go to that country or uh, not necessarily revolt, but you're going, you are going to create a movement in your country for people to be a little bit more educated by reading the right books so you understand the differences between socialism, capitalism, and communism, not just listen to the media that tells you capitalism sucks. And so we're hoping to create that movement. It's already created in 196 different countries, and we're just getting started. So it sounds like your past and what you experienced growing up played a big role in maybe wanting to play a bigger role in the entrepreneurial community as a whole. Oh, no doubt about it. Yeah, you know, you and I, uh, we're not as important as we think we are, and yet we're more important than we think we are. Life is filled with so many contradictions that's so confusing at times, but, you know, we got to learn to live with contradictions. The reason why we are not as important as we think we are is because we're going to die. That is going to happen. We are going to be gone. What is important is if we have a message that outlives us for generations that makes the place a better place for the people that follow us, who become better leaders, better creators, better innovators than us. So I'm living in that life, and uh, absolutely. I think anybody that we can help realize that they can make money on their own with their own efforts by using what they have here and what they have here, uh, once you start making money on your own mind, on your own heart, your self-respect, self-value, your time being with yourself, you start enjoying your own company more than anybody else's company, and that's a very good place to be in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. So that speaks to your higher purpose. It even speaks to what sparked your interest in playing a larger role in the entrepreneur community you know, as a virtual mentor to a lot of entrepreneurs. Now, for you personally, how do you define success? Alignment. I think it's purely alignment to me. Um, uh, uh, and what I mean by alignment, guys, is... You know, so, so I like to study people who are bitter and I like to study people who are happy. And again, everything to me in my mind is math. So I wanna solve for X. What causes somebody to be bitter? If a person's not creating anything new or being of value, you become bitter. Like think about it, if we're 80 years old, we're sitting at this table and we're grandpas and none of our grandkids wanna come and talk to us about advice about life. Cause we're just that old man there, right? And so at one point, there's going to be a minute or a second where we're going to lose everybody at this family reunion. It's going to be Thanksgiving. We're going to be sitting there saying, no one gives a shit about me. Wow. So what they're saying by not talking to me is I no longer have value to bring to the world. It's because all I did is play a safe life. Unfreaking believable. What the hell am I living for? I don't have a purpose to live. For what? I'm not bringing value. Versus you're at this table. And your grandkids say, hey, Pop, yeah, I remember my dad would tell me about the time you ran a business. Can you tell me more about that story? Hey, Pop, can you tell me what happened that one time when you did this? Hey, Dad, I'm thinking about going into the entrepreneur. Dad, I'm thinking about starting a business. Hey, Dad, I met this other guy. Hey, what do you think, Grandpa, about this one? Hey, did you see the president when he said this about the other president? Do you agree with him? Because this is what I think. What do you think? Because I know you wrote about it. That's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I was there when John Wooden died. I was at his hospital when he died. He was... 99 years old at the Ronald Reagan Library, I think in Westwood or Santa Monica, it's one of those two cities. Do you know how many people came to see this guy? Mm -hmm. And when they came and left, guys, they were in tears. When I tell you tears, I'm talking pure tears is what they were in. Why is that? The man made an impact. So, yes, I think it's very important for us to realize that we don't have as much time as we, we think we have. Uh, to make a difference with it. And the second thing is, which is completely contradictory, what I just told you right now is one person can make a difference in the world, period. And I think the more we view life from that standpoint that what am I going to be doing? What was I put here for? Uh, just ended up watching a movie. Uh, what was that movie? I don't know what movie it was, but in the movie, 
the guy tells, uh, uh, he tells the audience, he says, look, what is the purpose of sun? And the kid, the kid says, oh, now I was watching Ali's documentary and Ali, there was a conversation he had with his daughter, very emotional. It says, uh, hey, uh, baby, and his daughter is 11 years old at the time. He says, hey, baby, what, what, what is the purpose of a son? He says, dad, to keep me warm. What else is it? Well, I, I, I don't know. Sun helps plants grow. Sun helps us feed. Sun helps us. And he goes, on. what is the purpose of a tomato? What is the purpose of a tree? Oxygen, breathing. What is the purpose of this? He says, everything living has a purpose. What's your purpose? This father's trying to tell this 11-year-old kid that has a purpose. So I think sometimes when it comes back to us, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. I like nice things. I drive a nice uh, Lamborghini Aventador. I have a 458. I have an I-8. I live in a beautiful home. I have a $50,000 watch on. And I like this type of stuff. I, I actually really like the history behind Rolex, how many presidents have worn this, and how many the engineering and the debate between Ferrari, Enzo, and Lamborghini, the guy who was a whole different, and they created a car to compete. And then the, this, I, I mean, I like engineering. I love supporting innovators and entrepreneurs that created something out of nowhere. But all of that stuff's gonna die, and what you and I do to make an impact that connects the other guy is gonna outlive us. And so I try to make sure I balance both sides to keep me going, driven enough to get excited about the next project I gotta overcome, but at the same time, humble enough and clear enough to know that what is gonna outlast me is more important than what is currently in my hands. Um, it, absolutely, was, was there something, a, um, a, a light click on, or something where you, you built this really successful financial services company and and then you said well I have a bigger opportunity here to start you know, creating this really personal brand for myself where I can you know, create more awareness to the to the community is, is there something that clicked um, where you said wow I, I need to do this also where I can maybe serve out the higher purpose yeah so a lot of it was accidental I mean, this is a pure accidental thing. We were gonna shut down our YouTube channel after a year because the first YouTube show was called Two Minutes with Pat and not a single episode was ever two minutes. If you wanna watch some videos, go back and watch our first five YouTube Two Minutes with Pat videos and listen to the sound, listen to the quality and get prepared to be entertained, man. I mean, we were horrible at what we were doing. We didn't even know how to spell Facebook at first when we got started. We knew nothing about YouTube. We knew nothing about, you know, the music you use and you can't use this music. Oh shit, we just got a red flag. Let's contact them and hey YouTube, we're willing to go by. And we, are, we have clear standing, we're partners with them. We don't have any, we're all 100% flying colors, but we learned, we learned through a lot of mistakes. And, you know, eventually what I realized is that, you know, there's only so much of an impact you can make locally at the end of the day, last night, uh, there was a few hundred people that got together somewhere in LA. It's a place I've been to, it's in Beverly Hills. And they celebrated the best, best movies being made, okay? The Golden Globes, right? That was hosted by Jimmy Fallon and a famous speech that Meryl Streep made last night. So they got together and they celebrated different movies. People from all over the world, they're telling different stories, different things. I think, uh, interestingly so, what's crazy is, how actors are a bigger celebrity than entrepreneurs around the world, which is, which is unbelievable to me. Uh, they have more power and influence because of the way they make you and I feel when we see them on video. How much power is that, by the way? Think about it, Ryan. Mm -hmm. So I had to, at one point, I had this uh, uh, moment, epiphany moment, if you want to call it, to realize that if you truly want an impact, you know, make an impact around the world, you have to get a media empire around you. And so if I want to go out there and teach entrepreneurship and capitalism around the world, you got to have a big media platform. And if you don't, you could be the best person at delivering your message, but no one knows about it. You are irrelevant. And then if you have a great message and you have a good way of communicating it and you have a media backing, you are extremely relevant. So it was simply a pure accidental epiphany moment that we had. Wow. And just to touch on that again, also, like I've had some similar experiences with you know, connecting with people in in, our, in my space, our space in the hospitality industry, and you know, once you have an opportunity to help people, and you kind of get some feedback, and wow, Pat, you changed my life, you changed my perspective, my relationship, then it's like all you really want is more of it. Yeah, there's a there's a because you realize um, you are worth more. You realize people value you. You realize 
how much you can contribute back. There's a certain high you get from that. And, you know, I've come to realize I partied very hard growing up. I was a guy that was good at chasing skirts, and I liked nightclubs. I knew all of them. I'd go to all of them. I would go to Vegas every other weekend and party for a year and a half straight. And it was just something I enjoyed doing. I really enjoyed doing. And I, I tried to finish all the tequila in Kentucky and Tennessee. Couldn't do it. <laughs> I tried to drink as much as I could. I couldn't do it. I mean, so you, you figure all of those things that we seek to have a high, you know, smoking weed because you get high, you know, snorting, you know, coke because you get high. And it's unfortunate because there's so much of that going on right now. Or X because you get high. We're escaping from something because what our existing reality isn't high enough that we have to go to a different place to find that high. And I've re- learned from just a lot of dumb, stupid make mistakes and learning to do a few things right that the greatest highs to me is the highs that last a lifetime. Can you imagine walking around naturally being high 24 seven while somebody's gotta spend 50 bucks and snort something to get high and you can naturally be that high? See, I, I, wanna, I wanna seek that high. So when you talk about you, you guys took your Facebook page to over 100,000, that's not an easy thing to do for you guys taking it to that place. You didn't do that by getting lucky. You did that because other people saw value in what you were providing and you inspired somebody else to say, you know what, 100,000 of us wanna come and see what these guys gotta do because they make me feel better and they give me direction. And, and that feeling, my friends, is a very good feeling. Uh, now, it, it speaks volumes to you and your character that individuals sometimes will do things because it's self-serving, obviously, to be famous. But you looked at it as far as, like you said at the very beginning, mathematical problem. How do I make more of an impact? And to solve X, you saw that a part of that equation was people had a media empire and influence from that standpoint. It speaks volumes to your character. Now, let me ask, a lot of times, for individuals to really stay on mission, they have to say no to certain opportunities. Opportunities that, that may look attractive in the short run. Maybe it's a lot of money. Maybe it's a little bit more fame and notoriety, but it doesn't serve the higher purpose of the higher mission. Have you been in a spot in your career where you've had that situation? Oh. And so what was that? What was that? Yeah, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm famous for that. I mean, if you ask anybody that's worked with me, they'll tell you what pisses you off the most with Pat. Man, he always says no. Um, because, and I'll start it off even a little bit sooner, you know, when I started uh, bodybuilding and everybody else wanted to constantly go to the next fad, the next fad, the next fad, I stuck to bodybuilding. And I said no to a lot of other things because I enjoyed it. I, I mean, I knew the game is a very simple game. Find something, stick to it, and put a lot of effort into that one thing. And then uh, uh, I remember afterwards when I got involved in financial services and I remember selling insurance. I will never forget this. I'm selling insurance, life insurance, and who the hell wants to sell life insurance, right? And I'm in love with life insurance, crazy stuff. Most people think I'm a Silicon Valley tech guy, although uh, we are uh, a a technology company that happens to sell insurance, but that's a whole different side of a uh, conversation to have. So we start we start selling insurance, and I notice a lot of my peers are saying, "Hey, we have to also start doing mortgages because everybody's making money in mortgages." This is 0405, which in LA people were making 300 grand a month selling mortgages. So I'm like, "I don't know about that." No, Pat, we got to get into it. No, I don't know about that, Pat. We got to get into it. I, did you hear about what that guy's doing? And at that time, I'm not driving a nice car. These guys are driving Ferraris and Lambos and all this other stuff. I'm driving an Escalade. And an Escalade, listen, it's a nice car, don't get me wrong, but it ain't a Ferrari and a Lambo, right? When you go to a nightclub, the Escalade gets parked in the back during valet. The Lambo's <laughs> parked up front. Simple as that, there's nothing to be said about that. So I'm hearing these stories about these guys doing real estate, title, loans, all this stuff, and I'm doing insurance. And one day I get tempted. Let me tell you, I get tempted. I come home, I'm like, Man, if we only do this, and we can make this, and we can make that, and we can make this, and it was interesting. There were three examples. One guy ended up owing IRS $4 million because he got sued heavily for the lo- wrong type of loans they did, and he went to court. He got sued for so many different loans. They took everything away from him, everything. He has nothing today. The guy was making 400 a month. He had three phantoms at one point in front of his house, all paid for. Then there was another guy who uh, uh, was mixing um, mortgage money, so refinancing, uh, refinancing essentially money out of your equity and putting it into variable annuities, which you're not supposed to do. He lost all his licenses, lost nine of his executives who also lost their licenses. And we stuck to insurance. And so afterwards, when the mortgage crisis took place, everybody started going to 
uh, short sale loan modification, uh, REOs, bank owned REOs and you know gold and all this stuff. And I kept telling every guys, why don't you just pick one industry and stick to it? And we kept saying no, 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 no. And now today, I mean, I don't know, we have 50,000 plus life insurance policies on the books and Foresters, which is a $45 billion company, nobody in the world writes more insurance with them than us from anywhere in the world. We write more policies with them. And uh, we now have 3,000 agents selling insurance in 49 different states. We're about to get the last state knocked out of the way, which is Montana. I know they only have six people in that state, but we're about to get appointed also in Montana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so we focused. I focused purely on insurance. Even when I started Value Tim, a lot of people were confused. I'm doing insurance. Pat, you don't seem, you can do so much more. Why don't you come to Silicon Valley and partner with Snapchat? And why don't you come and go work with Travis at Uber? And why don't you go do this and do this? I said, right now I'm doing this. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing long term, but right now I'm doing this. And I started this industry day before 9-11, I'm sticking to it. Now go to Valuetainment. Valuetainment people call me and they offer me and they say, hey, why don't you do what some of these other, you know, what this guy's doing and that guy's doing and this guy's doing, you can make so much more money. Why are you making this flipping stuff free? You're costing us money, you shouldn't be doing this stuff for free. Charge people a couple thousand dollars. I don't wanna do it because I want to revolutionize, revolutionize our educational system, and to do that, you know, which will be launched here pretty soon, that's going to be revolutionary. That's going to be exciting. So, you know, I've had to say no many times, and I think it's a very powerful two-letter word to use. Good for you, bravo, bravo. Thank you, bravo. In, in terms of, of revolutionizing it, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have a ton of people that reach out to you from the audience with questions and. I, I'm sure more than you can handle. What are, to maybe speak a little bit about your audience, what are a lot of the common challenges that you see people facing over and over? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends on age, you know, it depends on age. For instance, a guy who's in high school will reach out and he's having a debate with his mom and dad because he doesn't want to go to college. So. We're, we're about to launch the book, Drop Out and Get School, that should come out any, any week now. It should be coming out in the next three weeks. It's gonna be a very controversial book. I mean, I'm, I'm writing a book to announce why 80% of kids should drop out of college. And I'm putting out the formula out there. Just recently, a guy named Billy Wilson, his story went uh, viral. He took a picture in front of Kent State flipping him off, and he posted it on his Facebook page, and I think it was shared some 26,000 times and they said, why did you drop out of college? He says, because I watched the value tainment video, drop out of college. And it was on USA Today, Huffington Post, BBC, everybody interviewed this guy, right? I want that to happen times a few million is what I want to happen. I want us to get the attention of um, the government to realize why the hell does a kid need to go to school for four years to get a bachelor's degree? Why can't somebody do it in 13 months? Why four years? Why do I need to take fine arts or all these physics when all I want to do is run a damn business and why are you giving me teachers who have never ran a business before but they're going to teach me how to run a business I don't get that part how do you know what it is to run a business I want to talk to people that have ran a business before now if I'm being taught by somebody who's going to teach me accounting and they used to be an accountant before oh, that makes a lot of sense I'm cool with that if I'm gonna have a teacher that's gonna teach me math because they were very good in math I'm cool with that that's fine I, I understand that part but when it comes down to business, I'm not, a, so again, going back to it, a kid in high school has asked me those questions. Graduating, when, when guys are graduating from high school and they're in college and they're going to college, they wanna drop out, it's a different question. Then after college, you got a guy that's uh, 28 years old, is running a business and his girlfriend or his family doesn't support the fact that he works 80 hours a week and his girlfriend asked him a question, is it me or is it the business or is it this or is it that? Then people ask about sales. How do I make my sales funnels better? How do I become a better salesman? How do I do that part? How do I brand myself? Where do I go raise money? Do I go raise money and do some revenue back funding? Do I go get a venture capital guy? Do I go to an angel? Do I go to my family? How do I start off raising money if I don't have any money yet and I don't have any soul but I have a great idea? What do I do with this? Then you got the guys that are running a business that's doing $100 million plus a year but they're having a hard time with their customer service. And I was just invited to a very, very, you know, few hundred billion dollar technology company that is doing their annual convention in Spain and they wanted me on their platform to talk for an entire day on customer service and customer uh, experience and how they can improve it. And they wanted us to do that. I can't do that. I'm already doing an event for PHP during that time, so I can't go to it. So then that's customer service, customer experience. Then it's how do I increase the value of the company, not just the amount of profits we're making. How do I do that? Hire, fire, how do I recruit good talent? There is, 
there is some, it's, it's like, it's so far, I'm, one minute I'm talking to a 13 year old kid, another minute I'm talking to a 43 year old CEO that's doing $180 million a year. So it's, it's a very vast, and so this is leading to something where just recently we got a lot of requests from people to say, Pat, why not do a three day event, something like in New York, where it's a value event, it's entrepreneurs only, put a workbook together and start from the morning till night for three days, what it is to be an entrepreneur, how to scale the business, are you a CFO, COO, president, sales, biz dev, founder, CEO, what are you, how can we go and get better at becoming a CEO, at marketing, all that stuff, so we're considering that right now, this, quite frankly, this may be the first year we'll actually do a live event like that. Very cool, do you, um do you, and I love your content, by the way, I subscribe to Valuetainment, anyone out there listening, I encourage you to, because you guys you guys put a ton of content out there. I mean, I feel like, especially now, I feel like almost every day there's something new coming out. Right. Yeah, you know, I saw the one saw the one this morning about you know, how to make 2017 like your year. Uh, so I, I appreciate a lot of the content you put out. Do you, do you decide what to put out based on the questions and what people yes. are reaching out with? Yes, absolutely. It gets to a point where, I mean, look, I'm always reading uh, business books, always reading business books that are gonna make my game tighter. I'm always reading stuff that's the boring business books that nobody wants to read. You know, it's like books this thick and who the hell wants to read a book like this? Because I'm just, I'm fascinated by business and entrepreneurship. But um, yeah, I think the best content we ever create is from the questions that we regularly get. And somebody will ask a question, and you know, Mario will come in, or the team will come in and say, these are the 38 questions that were asked this week that we really liked. We, all the other ones we've already done, here's the 38 questions. So what I wanted to do eventually is I said, look, why don't we keep creating these episodes based on the questions people are asking? So after now, and everybody asks a question and says, how do I do this? Here's a video. How do I do that? Here's a video. So we want to have an FAQ created with videos that are not two minute videos, it's a 20 minute video, because we don't, when people say, you should shorten your videos, we don't care, go somewhere else. It's free. You don't wanna watch it, it's not for you. We're totally, we're not trying to get everybody. Our videos, we go a little bit deeper, because we have stories involved, steps on what to do afterwards, content, maybe a book being recommended, so we'll go a little bit deeper than other people wanna go into, and we're comfortable with that. We know there's benefits to making shorter videos, but our watch time is 55% of the minutes people stick around, and, for whatever reason, if it's working, we're not, we're not changing that. So we'll take a list of questions and then we'll take those 38 questions and we'll make the four and then we'll grab a sheet of paper and people will ask me questions and we'll come up with 17 steps or six steps and then we shoot a video. That's great. Now, I don't know if you've seen this, Pat, but there's a picture that goes around online and has a picture of Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, says, would you rather $10 million or would you rather spend a year with that? All right, with that as a context, if somebody was gonna spend time with you, what philosophies would you make sure that you would imprint on them to send them off? You Let's speak with the, with the context of a, a, an aspiring entrepreneur. What would you imprint on them? You'd have a lot of confidence when you leave me, 100%. And here's why, because you would know um, that anything is, is solvable. You would know anything is solvable. Uh, we can solve any problem. You know, I was at Harvard at their OPM program and I'm sitting there, three entrepreneurs get up, one of them is trying to solve, they have the technology to warn a city and a country three minutes before an earthquake is about to hit. Can you imagine the insanity of that technology? Okay, another guy has the technology for Africa that is running out of water and they're struggling with the water supply. They have this technology that's gonna create a million gallons of water a day based on air and air only, nothing else. Think about this, like these world problems are gonna be solved at levels that we're gonna be laugh about some of these things on what we're doing. We think the internet is big, wait till some crazy things are gonna happen over the next uh, few years. So going back to uh, uh, what you're asking, you'll think about that part. You will be a worker, you will be a capitalist, uh, you will absolutely be a big uh, uh, advocate of teaching others about entrepreneurship. You'll study human nature much better. And um, you, but, but you will walk away knowing I can solve any problem. It's simple as that. I can solve any problem. It's solvable. It's all out there for us to figure it out. Wow. And to jump on just one more second before Chris, I know you have a question, but to, to kind of jump back a little bit, 
was there times in your entrepreneurial career when you lay at night, you're looking at the ceiling, your head spinning, and you have these fears that are circling around your head, and you're just concerned on what's going to happen next? Can you can you walk through what those fears were and how did you eventually overcome them? Oh my gosh, I remember one night I came back, I was on a two week uh, tour of visiting all the offices, and I came home, and when I came home, uh, I visited one of our associates. We were having dinner at this restaurant, and I got home like at 10:45, 11 o'clock, and I just there was so much going on in my life at that time with the business. I mean, I was I was about to you know go through some issues with losing a possible insurance carrier. I was about to lose the best guy in the company. I'm about to lose all my savings. I'm about to, I'm down to a few thousand dollars under checking account. And I came home that night, I'll never forget this, I came home that night and I couldn't breathe. It was a very weird night, I couldn't breathe. And I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't even like alcohol, believe it or not, even though I, in my army days I did a lot. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I'll smoke four cigars a year and I drink only because the other person is drinking. So I'll have a blue moon with somebody. That's pretty much it. So. I'm breathing very hard. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Then guys, all of a sudden, my, my, I start shaking. I'm, I'm shaking, I'm sweating, my palms are getting sweaty. I'm like, my gosh, what's going on to, my, to me right now? I'm, I call my wife, my wife sees me shaking, she's panicking. Call the ambulance, the ambulance comes, she's thinking I'm having a heart attack. The ambulance comes and I'm laying on the floor and I'm just shaking, shaking, shaking. My dad shows up, it's two o'clock in the morning. He's all panicking because my dad's had a ton of heart attacks. So they're thinking this is what's happening. And then the ambulance comes and they have everything ready, you know, to shock and everything. And, and then uh, they test my heart, they test everything. It says, no, you're not having, you, nothing's wrong with you. You're having a massive panic attack right now. So I go to the hospital and I go to the hospital and the guy starts asking me questions. How hard are you working? What are you doing with this? What are you doing with that? He's asking me all these questions. And I told him, he says, uh, hey man, you gotta, you gotta know, this was an anxiety and a panic attack. You just have a lot on your mind says, you got a lot on your mind. And I would tell you for about, for, for six straight months, I probably had an anxiety attack every other day. It's a very uncomfortable period in my life. I had an anxiety attack every other day. And it was very weird. Let me tell you why it's very weird, because I don't have health issues. Like, I'm a guy that takes care of my body, and I know, you know, like, I don't have, I don't have any challenges there. So, and I've never had anxiety or panic or any of those things. I mean, we, we just, it's never been a part of my MO. So it, it was interesting to know that how the body reacts and how the mind reacts. And it was that moment where I realized, man, we gotta really control this thing here. You really gotta control the mind. You gotta control your imagination. I think a lot of times anxiety attacks, imagine, uh, uh, panic attacks, I started studying both subjects. I just got obsessed with it. And I realized that uh, people who are depressed, they live in the past. People who have anxiety and panic attacks spend way too much time in the future. And I'm so much in the future that because I can't control it yet because it hasn't happened, that creates a panic and anxiety attack. And pieces to stay here. If you can stay in the equilibrium as much as possible, you're able to control the moment. But I can't control the past. I don't struggle with depression. But I struggled with this because I was so much about what the future holds. And the moment I figured out that formula, when it would happen, I'm processing my mind, working backwards. It's okay today, what can you do today? Let's deal with what we can do today. That's not the issue, what can you fix today? You're okay, boom, and then it went away. So it actually allowed the mind to be controlled once I knew it was taking place. Yeah. I, I don't know if you were waiting for that answer, by the way. I may have completely confused you when I give you the answer, but. I think powerful, powerful, yeah. very powerful. Absolutely, I think for me, it, it's, it's knowing I've been there before, you know, where it's like, how are we going to make payroll this this Friday? It, you know, are we going to be able to make things work or not? And and knowing that, okay, first of all, like, I think a lot of us starting out and even you know along the way get stuck and stifled by that feeling of, oh, what am I going to do next? And a lot of people aren't able to kind of push through. I know for me, it helps knowing that, okay, like, things haven't always gone as planned, but you know what? Based on what happened last week or last month that was challenging, I'm still here. So, you know what, tomorrow I'll still be here also. Let's try and figure it out. Uh, so that kind of, I guess, dovetails into a question I wanted to ask you, Pat. And I know I want to be respectful of your time, so maybe there's a few more questions we can get get in here, but 
What um, what do you think are some of the misconceptions that people have of entrepreneurship? Um, if you just touch on that. Yeah, I think you know one of them is you have to cheat to win. You know, you 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 got to cheat to win because you have to cheat here and you have to cheat there and you have to cheat. I don't think you have to cheat to win. I think you have to work your ass off to win. And I think sometimes some people want to cheat because they don't want to work their asses off. That's one of them. Um, and, and another thing about entrepreneurship is, you know, you need money to make money. I didn't start off uh, having money to make money. When I hit rock bottom, I went to a local guy and I asked him if I can sell stuff in the streets for him. And he gave me a few shirts to sell, so I went and bought the shirts eventually back from him for $2, and I sold the shirt in the streets, one for 15, two for 20. And I learned how to, how to hustle in the streets. And then eventually I was buying 100 shirts from him and selling them all in one day. I would buy 100 for 200 and I would sell it for Average twelve fifty a day, so I was making a grand a day selling T-shirts on corners of the most busiest street, and all my friends would see me and say, "Look at this guy! He's hit rock bottom. He's selling shirts on the street." And I would have no shirt off, and I'd be selling shirts. One shirt would say, "Osama Yo Mama," and the other shirt would say, "United We Stand." I had all these weird-looking shirts because it would sell. People like to buy it because it was during that time. So you need money to make money. That's one part. The other thing, uh, misconceptions is that. You cannot be successful, build a business, and have a good personal life and married life, you know, and kids and all this other stuff. Keep in mind, this entire time I'm talking, I got three kids under the age of five, three of them under the age of five. So we have a startup family. I'm married. Currently, I'm still married. We're happily married currently. And every time I say currently because I'm not this guy that's going to put the pressure of 50 years, we're going to be married for the rest of our lives. I know for a fact we'll be married one more year because... We love each other, we're having a good time, but I can tell you more importantly, a lot of times people get married simply because the sex is great. People get married for the dumbest reasons sometimes, the stupidest reasons people get married. Oh my gosh, she's incredible in bed. I don't care, go make an adult movie. You don't need to marry a girl that's great in bed. You know, he's so amazing. I've never had anybody do this one thing to me that he did. Phenomenal, go make a video, make some money off of it if you want to go into that business. Marriage isn't just about bed, man. Marriage is a lot of work. You can always fix the bed problem, but I think people marry for wrong reasons. And so uh, why somebody may have issues on a personal life and become an entrepreneur, and people will say, did you see that guy? He became a business and his personal life didn't work out. It's because he became a, and I am noble because to me, my marriage is more important than business, not money. All that guy cares about is money and we just bash this person. Stop it. You're a pansy for not wanting to run a business is what you are. Don't blame another guy that wants to go out and create something revolutionary in the world and you just want to hide behind somebody else. That's not what that guy wants to do. Nobody judges you for hiding. What the hell are you doing judging the other guy that wants to go out and build a big life? Now, here's the other thing I will tell you, though, about that part about relationships. It's very important um, uh, that before you get married, you know, I read a book. It was called 101 Questions to Ask Before You Get Engaged, okay? I gave that book to four girls that I was dating at the same time. When I say dating, I'm not talking sleeping with every one of them. I'm talking I'm dating, talking to four girls. And at that time, I kind of already knew what I was looking for. And every one of them, I had to read this book. They read the book. We got together. We answered the questions. And eventually, my wife read the book on our second date. I bought it for her as a present. And then on our third date, we got together at her house. And six hours, we went through every single question together. And then I said, then let's date, not the other way around. Then I said, let's date. And I set it up for her. And why am I saying this to you? Because you're thinking, what are some of the misconceptions? I think we marry the wrong way. I think we start businesses sometimes the wrong way. I think we have this idea that the reason why your last name is not Vanderbilt Gates or whatever that has access to money to help you start a company like your other friend in school whose father was a wealthy guy and gave him $300,000 and because you don't have a father like that, that's why you can't be an entrepreneur. I think that's an excuse you're looking for a cop out. There's many ways to make it. So, again, I have a video on YouTube called the uh, Nine Misconceptions of Entrepreneurship, and I go really deep into that one. Yeah, and a uh, question for you as it relates to that is, do you feel, now first I'll say, I appreciate your content, your transparency, uh, transparency and you continuously talk about how it's, it's about showing up, it's about putting in the work, that it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work to be an entrepreneur and, and make it, there's a lot of sacrifices. But do you feel that some of these misconceptions are because we do have individuals that are 
quote entrepreneurs that are helping to train and teach and coach and mentor entrepreneurs that are trying to monetize by making it attractive, making it seem easily, doing the clickbait yeah, type headlines because that's almost what society goes after. Yeah. You know? So it's almost like this like vicious cycle to get their attention. It's almost like some people feel they have to do that, but then you know, you, you, I, I see you nod and you see what I'm saying. So how do you get over that? Yeah. You know, what, what is that whole cycle like? Yeah, you know, it sells. I mean, you got to know what sells, what's attractive. You know, lose 10 pounds in a day, it sells. You know, you know, become a millionaire in, in a year, it sells. You know, marry the hottest girl by just doing this one thing to your abs, it sells. That's a, that's a very, that's, that's purely a marketing gimmick that's very effective. I mean, people do it all day long on TV. Budweiser sells you by, if you drink, you're going to get laid. So does the other most interesting man in the world. Everybody wanted to be the most interesting man in the world. Where do you think Dan Bilzerian got his idea about his whole beard? He wanted to be the most interesting man. I don't know if you guys know Dan Bilzerian who he is. He yeah. wanted to be the most interesting man in the world. So everybody sees him with shotguns, with girls, and all these boats and all that stuff. Okay, he's, you know, he wants to be the most interesting. And it works. It's a marketing effect of marketing where they got that idea from Karl Marx's beer and Keep, kids are coming out of school and it's kind of cool to be this guy that I don't give a shit, here's what I got, and if you do, you're gonna get laid. It, 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 it's one, one is one, like I'm gonna teach my kids to say, guys, this is effective, this works, this is what they're doing. Don't fall for it, but they're gonna do it. Don't fall for it. This is what's gonna happen here, dot, 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 right? And then the other part is about your moral integrity and what, what type of a life you wanna live. I mean, it's just not a life I want. There's many ways to make money, guys. I refuse to make money in most of the ways. But, you know, for instance, there's so many guys that'll tell you, pay me $10,000 right now and I'm gonna show you how to uh, get this social media 59 program step that you're gonna do that's gonna change your life and then I'm always posting pictures with girls and all this other stuff. And I'm hiring call girls that no one knows about and I'm paying them money and I'm telling them you're gonna be viewed by five million people. Hey, here's a way for you to become a model and be noticed. It's a marketing gimmick. It works, it's effective, it's in Hollywood. I was in LA for quite a long time, 26 years I lived in LA. This is very common, guys. I mean, I remember there was a, oh my gosh, this was embarrassing. There was a dating site in Encino, California, where the owner, I won't tell you who the owner was, the owner um, had uh, a guaranteed he would find a soulmate for you. So people were paying $3,500 for this guarantee, find a soulmate. Oh my gosh, and what they didn't know is he would hire five prostitutes, okay? And he would tell the girls, hey, go on a date with him, act as if you love him. If he calls me back and he tells me that he got some with you, I'll give you another $500 bonus. So here's two fifty dollars to go on a date with a guy that's going to pay for dinner. Who's not willing to do that? Great, I'll go and do it. But if you go above and beyond, I'll give you $500 bonus. This guy got $3,500. He pays seven fifty for the girl. I mean, that's a pretty wealthy pimp right there. People were doing it left and right. And the guys would call, she changed my life. She's the love of my life. Did they make a lot of money? Yes. Am I going to do that? Hell no. But some people did. And unfortunately, there's many ways to make money. I'm here to tell you capitalism eventually weeds out those people because those people get their names out there. <coughs> people eventually find out how they do business and, 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 and their formula of the way they're using capitalism won't work long-term for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Kind of, as we're kind of wrapping up here, maybe there's a few kind of bigger kind of picture questions. What advice would you give your uh, 20 year old self? Keep reading books. Really Keep reading books. Um, start partying. Stop partying earlier. I stopped partying at 24. Probably I could have partied four years earlier. At 20 years old, I was in the Army. Army was a great thing that happened to me. They really kicked my butt and turned me into a man. Uh, so I would have told them, you know, uh, uh, enjoy the time while you're in the Army because it's gonna go by quick and some of your best memories will be the ones from the military. But I would have told them, just focus on reading books and developing yourself. Focus on reading books and developing yourself. That'd be the first thing I'd tell myself. Now I'll ask this and then wrap, uh, Chris, you can wrap it up for us. Who, when you were starting out, did you look up to that helped develop and shape your core principles and strategies and way of thinking? I had a lot of local guys that were sales guys who were phenomenal guys as early uh, people to mentor me. One guy's name was Robbie Solomon. He was a uh, Bally Total Fitness supervisor. 
I liked his style. He was tough, and a lot of people didn't like him, but he was very tough. And he recommended me the first book to read, which was How to Master the Art of Selling. My sister told me to read Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People initially, which was great, but my, uh, uh, he recommended that book. Francisco Davis was patient with me and helping me develop my sales skills. He helped out a lot. A guy named Brian was a very hard-working entrepreneur that I learned you had to compete. Um, my dad taught me about hard work, period. And then for the rest of it, you know, guys, I will tell you, most of my mentors were dead people. I mean, I read books about people who were dead, and I want to know what Franklin did. How did Franklin do what he did? How did Rockefeller become who he became? What made Andrew Carnegie so flippin' special? You know, what is Milton Friedman doing to get a Nobel Prize in teaching the concept of capitalism? Why is this so effective? So I studied a lot of dead people um, that helped me get to where I'm at today as well. Well, and Pat, that, that leads into uh, your website. You know, I know you have the, your top 100 books for entrepreneurs, a, a stellar list on there. And you have the ultimate questionnaire which I know people can fill out, and I'm sure that helps people uh, help people look at their lives and, and probably answer a lot of questions they haven't really ever asked themselves. What, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the book that you have coming out soon and where people can find that and anything else maybe that you might have liked to touch on. Yeah, so if there's two things I would tell you, here's the two things. One, our goal is to get to a million subscribers on YouTube by the end of the year. So we're getting all these, you know, a bunch of valuetainers are sending us. We got this cool little thing that was sent today, which I thought it was really neat. A guy who runs a uh, trophy company uh, from Nevada. He runs a trophy company called Mixed Trophies. We have a goal of running a million subs by the end of the year. That's valuetainment. Uh, we'll be launching in a, a university here sometime mid-year, so stay tuned for that. But those are just uh, uh, that part. So if somebody wants to follow me, valuetainment will, will be the place. I respond back to questions on Snapchat. It's the best place to ask me questions. So if anybody wants to ask me questions on Snapchat, it's bitdavid19, the place to ask questions, my username. But Dropout and Get School will come out before February 1st. And it's going to call out academia, professors, parents, the government. It's going to call out everybody. And it's, it's, I mean, it's going to break down what it costs them to make books. It's going to break down the cost of education. It's going to break down how big of a business it's turned into. It's going to break down the biggest scam in the world on how these guys have been fooling people. Now, there are some universities that are doing it the right way, and they're doing it very, very good. But I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about why, while so many people in the world are concerned about robots one day taking over the world or artificial intelligence taking over the world, they have nothing to worry about with robots and AI because humans have become robots. So we don't need to worry about robots taking over the world. As humans, we need to start becoming humans and stop being robots. And the biggest difference is start questioning everything. Just really start questioning why the hell do we go to school for so many years? Start questioning it. Nowadays a kid goes to school for an engineering degree to learn how to code after six months, everything's changed already. So what four-year degree? To keep learning a new thing that's changing? No, if somebody wants to become an engineer for that, it's gotta be an ongoing, maybe a 12-month program, not a four-year program. So I just think we need to put the best minds together and rally people around the idea of uh, what we can do to improve the educational program. And so one of the ways we're gonna get a lot of people's attention is by creating a dropout revolution. We're going to have a lot of kids dropping out of college and posting stuff, and that's going to get a lot of people's attention. Very cool. Well, Pat, thank you for your time, and thank you for what you're doing. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad we've connected. Hey, gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and Pat, uh, we'll, um, we'll give you a nice uh, proper introduction at the beginning, and just send people to what, just to PatrickBetDavid.com? PatrickBetDavid.com. Yeah, a lot of things is there. Valuetainment would be good for you, too, because we're – uh, yeah, pushing for that mill and then the, the book the book won't come out for two and a half more weeks so once it does come out then you'll hear about that as well okay and let um I'll, I'll be in touch with Mario let him know when the the episode comes out and if, if I can uh, you know do a review for the book or, or share do a little mm -hmm. video for my audience be happy to that'd be great we would appreciate it if you do that yeah definitely thank you so much guys absolutely yeah thank, thank you, you. Much, appreciate so much have a good one take care fellas bye-bye okay.